Well, good morning, church. That may be the first thing they hear on the YouTube here. It's all right. As we tell folks all the time, that we record these and upload them to YouTube later, so anything you say can and will be used against you on YouTube. And so uh, we'll throw a comment on there later that, you know, whistling is all done by Jerry. But, uh, for those of you that went with us yesterday to the beach, appreciate you still being here this morning. For those of you that weren't with us, uh, we missed you. Um, but you may have heard that, uh, I think, and this is going to sound really funny. Do what? 11 what? Well, now I need to know. Oh, it's done. So this, I don't know how to, uh, I'll just say it and you can take it how you want. This is how it was. Everybody that got in the water yesterday got stung by a jellyfish other than me. <laughs> so I was the only one apparently that hit the water and, and before you think, oh, well, he just put his feet in. No, I was wandering out. I got out chest deep, didn't get stung. My youngest daughter got stung right next to me out that far and, and not, not, and I did not. So. Uh, everybody else got stung. There were jellyfish, all that. But everybody had a good time. The kids would get stung. They'd stay out of the water for about 20 minutes and then right back in. Didn't stop. So adults, on the other hand, I think Julie was still the one that was brave enough that got stung and went back. Everybody else was like, I mean, that's it. We're out. No more. Uh, but everybody had a great time, and, and it was a great time of fellowship and together there. So hopefully we'll set something up like that again soon. And uh, if you weren't able to go this last time, I highly encourage you to go next time. Everybody had a blast. Even those that didn't get in the water sat out and had fellowship, and, and uh, Sarah was there. They brought a ukulele, and they were singing songs on the beach, and food was there. Nobody went home hungry. Everybody had plenty of cold drinks, waters, and all that, and, and so we were able to, to do that. Well, as we pick up today, Acts 18 is where we're picking up after last week at 17 and jumping into this week. Sort of where we're at is the ministry journey of, of Paul and Timothy and Silas and these guys and their planting of churches and what happens when they're doing that. And today at 18, if you have subtitles over your, your scripture, it says the founding of the Corinthian church at verse 1. And we're going to get as far as we can through 18 today. We may get all the way. We may not. Uh, but we think about this and what Paul's doing. Paul is traveling around and he's just he's planting churches. He's leading people to Christ. He's working on the Jews and he's planting churches and ministries that can keep working after he's gone. The sign of any good missionary is exactly that. A missionary doesn't just want to come into an area, impact it for a moment, and then that impact fall apart when they leave. A missionary wants to come and impact an area and then leave something there as they move on that continues to grow and build and become stronger. Because a good missionary or any Christ follower that calls himself a missionary of the gospel should understand that it should not be built upon us in our humanity. It should be built upon Christ should be built upon God as we talked some in Sunday school today that when we look at churches our churches should be built upon Christ not a personality not a certain ministry not an organization it should be built on Jesus because if it's built on Jesus it'll last it will stay ministries come and go Jesus is forever and so we jump back here at 18 with Paul and it says this. After this, he left from Athens and went to Corinth where he found a Jewish man named Aquila, a native of Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla because Claudius had ordered all the Jews to leave Rome. Paul came to them. Paul traveled to them. So we pause here for a moment and realize So this is the neat thing about this part of scripture as we're looking at this is we can date this. We can go back and look at the historical documents and see exactly when this stuff was going on. So we can back this up. And so if we look at this, when the Jews were excluded out of Rome, uh, it was around 41 AD. Well, in 49 AD, he expelled them all together. In 41 AD, they started encouraging Jews, hey, we're not going to throw you out, but really not happy with you in Rome. By 49 AD, it was a, you are no longer welcome here. It's time to leave. Get out. And so we can date this between 41 and 50 A.D. So we know when this happened. We have historical records other than the Bible that show this was going on. And if you're anything like me, this kind of stuff intrigues you. I nerd out, I geek out over this stuff because I love looking at the historical side that supports Scripture. Because one of the neat things about the Bible is it's one of the few books that is not only supported by itself in its, in, its, in, in, in its historical importance and it's an importance as a faith thing that leads us to Jesus, it's backed up 
by historical truth. We can look and see where these things happen. I was actually talking with Jared yesterday about how this stuff it, it intrigues my nerd brain, is what I said to him. Especially a few years ago, we looked at, I remember a few months ago, we even talked about the scuba diver who was swallowed up by a whale and then spit back up, right? It's all over the news. But a few years before that, the first uh, archaeological dig that found a singlet ring that backed up the historical truth of the King Hezekiah, the biblical King Hezekiah. We found, they found one of the singlet rings that proved he existed other than seeing him in scripture. And I love that stuff because it's an opportunity for me when I deal with people out in society that they try to say, oh, well, that Bible is just a bunch of stuff put together by people that say what they want it to say. Well, okay, you may say that, but how do you back up that we found this singlet ring that backed him up? We find all these other things that show the Bible to be true other than the Bible. And so I love when we have these things that we can look at this date and go, yes, we knew that this happened other than seeing it in Scripture. And so Paul's coming to them here and it says in 3, being of the same occupation, stayed with them and worked, for they were tent makers by trade. And so we see here Paul, you know, doing a little bit of work, getting his hands dirty as it would be. He reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and tried to persuade both Jews and Greeks. And so what's he doing? Well, during the week he's working with them, he's helping them in their trade, he's bringing in a living, he's doing these things. But then on the Sabbath, he's in there ministering and witnessing both to both Jews and Greeks. When we get to five, when Silas and Timothy came down from Macedonia, Paul was occupied with preaching the message and solemnly testifying to the Jews that Messiah is Jesus. Notice there, Paul's not beating around the bush here, right? There is no, well, might be, might be. No, this is direct. There is no, you don't back down from that, right? Who's the Messiah? Jesus. Anybody else? Nope. Jesus. Where the world today kind of works with us in that to, to think, oh, well, the world will tell you, you know, whatever makes you happy, right? That's the ploy of the world. Whatever you think is true is true. What's the problem with that if we think about it? Everybody can't be true. If everyone is true, no one is. There is one truth, just as there is one Messiah, and his name is Jesus. Paul presented them to this that we see at six. But when they resisted and blasphemed, he shook out his clothes and told them, your blood is on your own heads. I am clean. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. Such a strong statement there by Paul. And we have to think about what he's doing here. He's presented them truth, told them Messiah is Jesus. They're still resisting. And so what he's telling them is, I've told you all the truth I can. You know what the answer is. You just refuse to do it. Let that sink in on us for a minute. Think about us in humanity. How many of us know what we need to do, yet we refuse to do it? We know what needs to happen. But what do we say? We talk ourselves out of it. Right? I'll start tomorrow. Right? We've talked about this before around the new year. Greatest time to be in the gym business usually is what? Around New Year's. Why? New Year's resolution, right? I'm getting better shape. I'm going to do it. Some stick with it, some don't. You may have heard this before, right? Procrastinators unite when? Tomorrow. In our humanity, we're guilty of this. I'll do it later. I've got time. How many of you heard someone say that, that that on their deathbed, I thought I had more time. I didn't know. I'd have done it different. Don't wait for that. Don't wait for the, I thought I had more time. Now. Just as here, when they're arguing with him, he finally turns around and says, listen, this is on you. I've told you who the Messiah is. I've told you what you need. If you're going to accept him, you're going to accept him. If not... It's on you. In the same way for us today. Your salvation. It's not on me. I can present you the gospel. I can show you who Jesus is. I can offer you him. But ultimately, you have to choose. I have to choose. 
My salvation is not on any other human on this earth right now. It's on me. I had to make that choice. I had to take those steps, just as you do. And we see here with Paul that at this point, he finally says, that's it. I've given you everything. I'm moving on. And the same way for us in our own lives, we've talked about this before, that you don't have to continue to beat your head against the wall with people that you have offered the gospel to. We're not saying cut them out and never talk to them again. But if they know, if you've shown them, this is who Jesus is, this is what you need. You are okay in saying, hey, I've told you, I'm done. And so what we see in seven, so he left from there and went to the house of a man named Titus Justice. Or Titius Justice. Isn't that just a great, like the Romans sometimes, they get everything right, but name-wise... Sometimes you just run across something and you're like, yes, right? That is just what we want. I was talking to, I think it was Sarah and Cameron yesterday about at an RA camp I had preached in the past. We brought in a blacksmith to the RA camp. And, and sometimes you meet somebody and you hear their name and you're like, yes, your name is exactly for your profession, right? We met this man at an RA camp who was a blacksmith named Chuck Stone, right? If there is not a more blacksmith name out there, and then you meet him and you're like, yes, the name, the whole thing, just Chuck Stone Blacksmith. Like it just fits. And so we see here with this name, occasionally those Romans, you know, just those names get, get it right. And then we see a worshiper of God described by him, which again, you see that name and then how sweet would it be to hear your name said? And then the first thing that comes up after that is what? Worshiper of God. Not his profession, not his family, not just... Worshipper of God. That's what he's defined as. That's what he's known as. That's the thing that if you're going to describe this guy the way, if the name doesn't do it, right? Because this is what we do, right? If I'm trying to describe someone, you know, and this happens a lot when we get new faces in the church and I meet them and then somebody comes to me and they're trying to, you know, well, there's this new guy coming, right? And he's, and they'll, they may not know the name. So I'll say, oh, you mean so-and-so. And they're like, well, and then what do I have to do then? Describe him. They look like this. Yeah, that's the one. How awesome would it be that if anytime somebody hears our name and they don't realize what our, and the name doesn't do it, and somebody says, oh, they're a worshiper of God, and they're like, exactly. That's who I'm talking about. So then we see whose house was next door to the synagogue. Crispus, the leader of the synagogue, believed the Lord along with his whole household, and many of the Corinthians, when they heard, believed and were baptized. Notice here, Paul connects with this guy begins working through him. Does it come to start something necessarily new? Comes to build off of what's going on here. Same thing for us inside of our life with Christ today, inside of our ministry with Christ. We may be called to start something new on occasion, but it is okay for us to unite with other believers that have already started something and support and work with that. To move forward with it. So then we get to nine. Then the Lord said to Paul in a night vision, don't be afraid, but keep on speaking and don't be silent for I am with you and will no, and no one will lay a hand on you to hurt you because I have many people in this city. Right. We think about some of the things God says and sometimes we kind of blow by it, but you just imagine God telling you that, like, don't be afraid. No one's going to lay a hand on you. Why? Because I've got people. Right? That's a gangster movie, isn't it? Like, that's Godfather level. Right? Don't worry about it. My people will get their people. Right? That's the beginning of an old school gangster movie. And so we see here Paul being told that, don't be afraid. In the same way for us today, as believers, we don't need to fear because we are a family. Again, Jared and I talking yesterday, telling him that we were talking about the fear of the world, the world being afraid a lot of the time. And, and we kind of boiled it down to this, that the world becomes afraid because it's alone. The world separates people and gets them by themselves and then they become afraid. And the thing about us being believers, the thing about us being a family of God is that we know that when push comes to shove, we can pick up the phone and call each other. And we're going to be there. That it may be, as I said to Jared yesterday, maybe you call me and say, hey, I'm not, I can't be there myself right now, but I know a guy and I'm on the phone. I'm making somebody's going to be there. Somebody will be there. That's what Paul's being told right here. You may feel like you're alone, but you're not. You've got brothers and sisters in Christ that are there to help you. 
And so because of that, we see this in 11. And he stayed there a year and six months teaching the word of God among them. And then we get to 12. It says, well, Gallio, Gallio is the technical name. It's not Galileo. It's Gallio. It was proconsul of Achaia, which again, we can take this. This is AD 51. So we're moving into AD 51 now. The Jews made a united attack against Paul and brought him to the judge's bench. This man, they said, persuades people to worship God contrary to the law. Now you can see here the Jews being very careful in their wording here because as a proconsul, this guy would not necessarily understand Jewish law, but they didn't say Jewish law, right? They were careful in their words and said law because what they're hoping for is that this guy will find Paul to be a threat to the Roman Empire and kill him. Most people, though, because Paul didn't always lead with this, don't remember that Paul is what? Roman citizen. Paul would hold that card in his back pocket until he needed it. In the same way that I, I talk with some of you here that when I'm out and about with folks, I don't always lead with the fact that I'm a pastor for a living. Because a lot of times when you lead with that fact, people are just, they're gone. Their walls come up, they don't want anything, and they're gone. But when I just get to know them a little bit and eventually lean into the fact of what I do for a living, now I've got you. And so Paul's holding this card in his back pocket of, you know, I'm Roman. And so we see this. They use that word law and they're using it two ways. We talk about this in our humanity and you'll hear me say this a lot that when we pray, we need to be specific in our prayers. In the same way in our lives, we need to be specific when it comes to how we talk to people about Jesus. Be direct and to the point. So then we get to 14. It says, as Paul was about to open his mouth, uh, Gaio speaks to the Jews. If it were a matter of crime or moral evil, it would be reasonable for me to put up with you Jews. You can kind of see here how he feels about them at this point, right? This is not the first time they've dealt with this, and he's kind of sick of it. 15, but if these are questions about words, names, and your own law, see to it yourself. I don't want to be a judge of such things. And so then he drives them away from the bench. He's telling them, you need to handle your own business. For us as believers, we look at this and I look at it and I take two things from it. Number one, that we as believers should be able to handle things amongst ourselves. We should be able to talk to each other reasonably and work through things together. Understanding that we may not always see things the same way, but ultimately we are all centered on Christ. And he is the great uniter. And we should be able to find that middle ground and work through things together. Obviously, here, these Jews, they're not of Jesus. And so there's no middle ground between them. They need Jesus first. But then we get to 17 and we see this. Then they seized Sosanthenes, who is called brother in 1 Corinthians 1.1. 1, 1, if you didn't know that, he pops up later. Says this, the leader of the synagogue, they beat him in front of the judge's bench. But none of these things concerned him, concerned Gaia. And I could almost see in the moment, right, what they're doing here is they didn't get the answer they wanted from the world. The Jews didn't get the answer they wanted from the court. So what do they do? They start beating this man and then probably looking at the court going, why are you making us do this to him? Just like us, when we don't get our way with God. If we're not careful, when we don't get what we want or what we think we want with God, we will blame Him for our actions. And if you don't believe me, you only need simply go back to Genesis and look at Adam. Right? Easy for us to blow past that sometimes. You sit around here long enough, you're going to hear me say this again. But when we look at Adam in the garden, when God confronts him and Eve with, what have you done? What did you do? What was Adam's reply? And it's easy for us, right? It's sometimes it gets misquoted. You say in church long enough, you'll hear somebody say this. Oh, he just, you know, it's Eve's fault. Eve did it. Go back and reread in Genesis. That's not what Adam says. He turns around and says, this woman you gave me, God. He tries to throw God under the bus for his inaction, for his sin. It's your fault I did this. And we've continued to do it for generations. Well, if God would just give me what I want, well, then I'd serve. And I'd do what He calls me to do. It makes no sense. 
No sense whatsoever. Because if that's the truth, if, if God would just give you and then you would serve, well then God ceases to be God. You become your own God. I find myself more often now as I'm getting, you know, I say older and you laugh, some of you will laugh at me when I say that. But as I get older, I find myself more often than not thanking God for what I didn't get. I thank God for his nose. Right now, the kids, all they heard was like the nose on your face. Adults, you can explain that one later. I thank God for the time he tells me no. For the time that he shuts that door. I mean, thinking about it, and we talked about this some on the trip yesterday with some of the other folks on the bus, that when God was setting up the ability for us to come just here, that there were other churches we had spoken to, other churches we had gone down the road with about maybe going and serving, but every single time, God shut the door. Not just kind of, He would slam the door shut to make us understand that that was not the place. That was a no, a firm no. It wasn't until we began to talk with Trinity that the doors opened wide. And we heard the yes. In our humanity, though, every time the no happened, we were disappointed. It hurt. I tell Courtney sometimes, this is what I'd say to her all the time when we were talking to some of these churches and the no would happen. I said, you know, sometimes it would just be nice to be the prettiest girl to dance, right? Just be nice. The problem was, I would get down on myself. And I would ask that question, God, why are you making me do this if every time the answer is no? Why are you telling me this is the thing if every time the answer is no? I wasn't looking at what God was doing. And then we come here, and the door is open, and everything opens up, and God makes it happen. And I have to turn around and say, God, thank you for the no's. Thank you for protecting me from what I thought I wanted. Because it wasn't good in comparison to what you had. But if we're not careful, we slip straight into this mindset of 17. Of blaming God for our bad behavior. The challenge for us today as believers is to own it. To trust God in the no's and praise Him in the yeses. And praise Him through the no's. To understand that it's more important for us to be lovers of God, to have our names described as worshiper of God than be described as anything. And if you're here today, the way that starts, you want to be described as a worshiper of God, that starts with beginning a relationship to God. As we saw Paul say earlier, the Messiah is Jesus. I can't say it any clearer than that. The one who came to save the world, the one who died for your sin, his name is Jesus. He is Messiah. If you do not have a relationship with him, that is absolutely step one. That is what you need more than anything else. If you're here today and you find yourself as a believer, you've given your life to Christ, but you find yourself maybe agreeing a little bit more than you should with the Jews here, then it's time for us to get out of our own way. To be willing to admit, God, not my will, but your will be done. What is it that you have for me? Because that matters more than what I want. To praise God when he says no. As much as you praise him when he says yes. In a few moments when we open this up, I'm going to challenge you that if you're here today and you know that you know Jesus is Messiah and you need to proclaim that, you need to make that public, you need to accept him as Lord and Savior, then you come and let's begin that relationship. Let's pray together. Let's work through it. If you're here today and you know that you're finding yourself maybe agreeing with these Jews then a little more than you should, let's pray about that. Let's get ourselves out of the way. Seek Jesus. Let's build this thing upon Jesus, not anything else. With that in mind, let us pray. God, we thank you for today. Thank you for the opportunity to gather, to study your word. God, we thank you for the example of Paul who would 
be clear. Messiah is Jesus. We pray for those that are here today that maybe haven't done that, that haven't stepped out in that yet, accepted you, praised you, given their lives to you. We pray that maybe today they'd step out in faith and admit sin and begin that relationship. That they would become a brother and sister of Christ. No longer a friend of the world. God, that those that have accepted but find us, find ourselves sort of blaming you for our inaction or for our problems, that we would put that behind us and begin to seek you. That we would praise you in the no's as much as we praise in the yeses. That we would firm our trust in you. Because you are Messiah. You are perfection. And it's in that name of perfection we pray, that name of Jesus. We turn this over to you. The church says amen. Stand with us, church, if you will. Thank you so much for joining us as we continued our study in Acts. Remember, if you're able, we'd love to have you join us in person Sunday starting at 10 o'clock, Big Church at 11. Wednesdays at 6.30. If you breathe oxygen, there is something for you here at any of those times, and we would absolutely love to have you. If that's not possible yet, we will continue to see you right here on YouTube. Remember, we love you. There's nothing you can do about that. Until we see you in person, stay safe.